welcome to the third session of QCTIP. So next we've got an uh, invited speaker, Professor Simon Benjamin from the University of Oxford, who's also founder of Quantum Motion. So Simon's going to say a bit about uh, VQE, I believe. Okay, Simon. All right. Well, thank you very much, Earl, and thank you very much to the organisers. Uh, this is a first time for me, so please forgive me if uh, things are a little bit uh, rough in the presentation. So hopefully everybody can see my uh, lead slide. Let me whiz on. Um, okay, that's an immediate weird thing. Okay. <laughs> um, so hopefully everyone can see my second slide, which is uh, saying, yes, I'd like to talk about uh, quantum variational algorithms, which are interesting for a lot of different reasons. But I think the, 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 the main reason is that we all hope that they will help us to extract some value from relatively small quantum computers as we try and make the journey towards the uh, giant fault tolerant machines that we hope will exist one day. So um, this is my group. It's a little bit of an old photo, but uh, it's got the key people who I'll uh, name check in this talk um, all in the photo. So uh, variational algorithm, uh, just as a reminder what we might be talking about here, we have some kind of quantum circuit that takes an input state such as all zero and turns it into something interesting coming out the other end. It uh, has a whole bunch of gate operations in it. And what's interesting is each of those gates is, actually takes a classical parameter, which we can think of as a knob on the side of, the, uh, of that gate. And uh, we can imagine it as an angle. And let's say when the angle is zero, then the gate doesn't do anything at all. It's just the identity matrix. And as we increase the angle, the gate's behavior changes, perhaps at some angle like 90 degrees, it has its full effect so that a control X rotation at 90 degrees would become a C naught, but we are free to change that parameter. So now we're describing our quantum circuit with a whole bunch of numbers, classical numbers, and uh, we hope that for some set of those numbers, the thing, the circuit does some task we're very interested in. But the challenge is, how are we going to find those numbers? We don't know them at the beginning. We don't know how to get that value out of our circuit, so we need a means to discover it. And we do this as part of a closed loop, uh, generally, where a classical computer is updating num the numbers to try something different. We're making some measurements from the quantum circuit to see if we're on the right track, and we iterate and iterate maybe a great many times and see if we can reach the, the interesting behavior. So with that uh, context, everything I'm going to say I think is in that, is that the context. I'm going to have one slide that, uh, oh, someone is flashing a more at me, and I'm going to have to see what that means. And there's a bit of chat. Um, we can all see your color, your keynote color wheel. Okay, that is surprising because I cannot see it. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is experiment around a bit. Um, I might stop the share just for a minute to see if I can fix that. And now I'm going to try sharing again. And we'll see what happens. Uh, please share the right screen this time. Um, oh, feel free to chime up if if you think that uh, the uh, you might have muted yourself, but if you think that, uh, that that sort of somehow the presentation is a bit screwed up, I'm hoping that that's got rid of the color wheel. I don't know if it has or not. Um, so hopefully you can at least. Oh, now I'm, I'm finding out the answer to that question. Uh, all fine now. All right. Okay. So powering on. Let's hope that that was uh, the only technical gremlin. Um, and uh, so here's, here's the list of things. We're going to power through it. I guess I don't need to talk through the contents page. So this slide has a lot on it, but uh, let's not uh, spend too much time on it. I just want to throw out there that uh, many of the numerical calculations that I'll show you were done with a tool set that uh, my group developed, but it's open source, so many people contribute. It's called Quest, and you can find out about it at this link at the bottom of the page. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but uh, it's down there at uh, questlink.qtechtheory.org. Um, in fact, that's the slightly fancier version, which is referred to in this slide. And uh, that is a, a version of the tool that allows you to use a great many powerful and very efficient functions as a kind of extension to Mathematica. All you need to do is copy and paste one line of uh, text at the top of your Mathematica workspace, your workbook, and then suddenly Mathematica 
uh, knows a great deal more about how to very efficiently simulate quantum systems in the presence of general noise and all sorts of good stuff. So please do, there's a link if that's the kind of thing that you're in the market for. All right, so uh, the main point of, part of my talk I'd like to present as the story of a special matrix that I've been uh, getting very familiar at staring with at uh, for a few years. And very recently, um, we've understood uh, what the thing is really. So I'd like to take you through that. Um, starts by thinking, how could we use one of these variational algorithms that you see in the, again, in the cartoon there, to uh, do something a little bit, a little bit less common than the, the most commonly chosen tasks, which is to make the output of the circuit follow the evolution of a state under some Hamiltonian. So it's to follow the time dynamics of a state. So as I update the parameters, I want the output of my circuit to change and um, to incrementally uh, take forward snapshots in time of a quantum system. And this can be very useful. You could just see that using this in uh, many body physics or in chemistry and so on to see the time dy dynamics of a thing. How might we do this uh, in the variational approach? So we could take the Schrodinger equation, uh, move it all over to the left-hand side, uh, switch out the, the real, the, you know, the correct ideal state, as it were, with the kind of states that this circuit can actually create. Uh, the circuit may not be able to create the ideal state that uh, follows the Schrodinger evolution, but we want it to do its best. Uh, so there's our state that's parameterized by these angles theta. And we need to know what's the rule for how to update them, which is the theta dot in this notation. How should I change my parameters? How can I find that out? Well, I can use a variational principle. So I can take the norm of this, this thing that ideally should be zero. It might not be zero um, because we might not be able to quite perfectly track the evolution, but we'll do our best. And our rule for how to update the parameters will be uh, just to uh, respect essentially that, that this should stay at a, at a minimum. Uh, if we do all that, what we find out is the following. Yes, it uh, looks like we can do it. It looks like there's a rule for how to update the parameters. And the rule looks like this in the middle of the screen there. There's some matrix A. And that multiplies by the things we want to find out, the, the way of changing the parameters. And it's equal on the other side to some vector C. And here are those, those objects. Um, the vector object, uh, I'll say a, a thing about in a moment, that's not very mysterious. The matrix object is very interesting. In fact, I think that's on my next slide. So that, that, that uh, oh, I should have said, and, and it's the task of the classical computer to invert this equation. It had, once we've gathered the uh, elements of C and, and the elements of matrix A from um, our quantum coprocessor, then a classical computer uh, needs to invert that to find out uh, how we should actually update the parameters. And that's not entirely trivial. Uh, there can be some, some tricks to that. Um, but C, the C object is not so strange. In fact, its real part is just the energy gradient. But this matrix A is very interesting. And uh, I want to come back to it. I'm not going to try and explain it too much at the moment. You can see what's the kind of thing that's going on in there is that we have the way the state changes with the output state changes with one of the parameters uh, in a product with the way the state changes with another one of the parameters. And that populates the matrix. Uh, well, we didn't obtain a full intuition about this thing in our uh, first work. But we showed the, what we pragmatically thought were the important things which is that we could uh, obtain A and obtain C experimentally, that indeed then the real-time evolution um, is correctly reconstructed over time as we iterate with our classical computer, including any inadequacies in the circuit itself. It just does its best. And we went on to explore error mitigation that I'll say a word about later. Um, and this, so we were doing this a few years back and we've continued to develop it. I would refer you to the, the lower paper on this screen an archive paper for a comprehensive introduction, including some different ways into the problem uh, other than using the McLaughlin variational principle. But let me power on because what happened next was we got chatting to uh, the guys at um, IBM about uh, error mitigation. And uh, we, uh, because they had a very nice paper out at around the same time. And uh, Sergey made a suggestion to us. He said, uh, you should try imaginary time and see if that makes for a nice eigensolver which turned out to be a great suggestion. So before I can tell you too much about that, let me just quickly remind you about eigensolvers, which tend to be the, the absolutely bread and butter use of the uh, variational technique. So um, you probably already know, but I'm gonna give it to you again in, a, in the context of a super toy model that we can all solve, in fact, uh, in our heads. So here we have a Hamiltonian over on the right, 
And we can see by inspection that the ground state of this Hamiltonian is 1, 1. It's a two qubit problem. Both qubits should be in state 1. Then the system will have energy 0. And over on the left there is our circuit. It's only got two gates, a single qubit gate and a two qubit gate. And um, our challenge is to find the correct parameters. Well, that's not much of a challenge, but it, it, it serves to illustrate the method. And because it's only two parameters and then there's an energy that we're interested in, we can plot that as a three-dimensional plot, and there it is. So the most obvious thing to do would be what we might call regular or uh, vanilla gradient descent. So then we would update our parameters in uh, such a way that uh, we are able to um, go downhill in energy. We figure out a vector in parameter space that points downhill from where we are right now, and we go a little distance in that way and then check again. Um, and the aim is to get to the ground state energy of the problem. So uh, as I mentioned, this comes out as just the real part. What we need to exper experimentally uh, figure out is just the real part of that C vector I mentioned. And how does it go? Well, here we start off near the top of one of those peaks, and we go straight down in gradient, and brilliant, we reach the, the lowest point. But the method, even for this toy problem, is not infallible. It depends where we start from. Let's start from this variety of positions, and we see that sometimes we get to the ground state, but sometimes we get trapped in one of these trenches. These trenches have zero gradient, and so the principle doesn't tell us to move any further. We could see that we could uh, ad hoc add some, some rules to try and sort this out, but uh, in its sort of pure form, we see that uh, the gradient descent method can, quote unquote, easily become trapped. Um, so, you know, the, it's, there's motivation there to look for, for different ways of exploring the space. All right, so uh, what about this imaginary time thing? I'm going to go quite quickly over the next few slides, but uh, roughly it's like this. So an imaginary time evolution would uh, follow this kind of rule. It's not a unitary evolution, so it couldn't be uh, done inside a closed quantum computer. But remember, we're iterating with a classical machine in classical update steps, so we can do kind of whatever we want. Here we have uh, an e to the minus h tau. It would look like a Schrodinger type solution if there was an i in there, but there isn't. So what this does is it actually attenuates the wave function, and it attenuates terms in the wave function according to their energy, leaving us at last with only the lowest energy term. So I'm going to flip through the next few slides because the, the long story short is it's pretty simple to adapt what we'd already done into this new context. Uh, I might populate this slide just at the bottom left. At, at the bottom here is a little diagram, a little sketch to show you that it's actually quite easy to work these things out. And in fact, right on this slide here, we see an object A, and it's exactly the same thing as we were looking at before. Not entirely surprising because we're just adapting the previous technique. Um, and actually figuring out those terms is, is quite simple in the lab. You just run the circuit, the full circuit you would have run anyway, and you put in a couple of extra gates. So it's not as sort of fearsome to evaluate as one might imagine. Okay, so let's go back to our toy model and see what happens. So this is with uh, standard gradient descent. And this is what happens when we apply the inverse of that mysterious, well, it's not mysterious, but that matrix A. And you can see that now, uh, we have some, uh, we, in fact, in this particular case, we always get to the ground state and we never get trapped. The system just veers around and avoids these, these trenches that would otherwise trap it. So that's, that's nice to develop an intuitive picture of what's going on. The inverse of the matrix A is redirecting the raw gradient, as it were, uh, changing its direction, sometimes uh, quite profoundly, and it's steering us to the ground state. This looks really good, and, and I, I should say that uh, you know, it, it is possible for this imaginary time process to also get stuck in um, more complex problems, but we find it's pretty much always better to do this uh, than it is to do regular gradient descent. And here's a paper that came out in uh, Nature Partner Journal Q uh, Quantum Information, where we do that uh, for a bit more of a meaty problem, where we're looking at lithium hydride and uh, comparing gradients, I'm just checking my time, comparing gradient descent to uh, canonical, um, excuse me, imaginary time gradient descent, the beefed up version with the A matrix uh, to, the, to the regular kind. And it, it really is quite a striking difference in this paper and in every time we use it. Um, so what's the summary so far? Good point to sort of take stock. Uh, if we're looking at these variational algorithms, there's a couple of objects which are interesting. One of them is a certain vector that I've been writing as C, and the other is this matrix. 
And uh, if we have access to these things, well, even without the matrix, we can do regular gradient descent. If we have the matrix, then we can do a better gradient descent. And we can also do things, new things, like be able to track the Schrodinger evolution of the system. But what is the intuition behind this, this interesting object then? How is, it, how is it enabling these enhanced forms of quantum variational algorithm? Well, uh, a paper not, I'm afraid, from our group, uh, not even with an author from our group, uh, but by uh, James Stokes and uh, this team here, which uh, came out uh, in the second half of last year, basically told us the answer, which is that there is a thing called natural gradients in um, classical machine learning and optimization theory. And these authors uh, mapped natural gradients into the quantum world in the context of variational algorithms. And they came up with exactly the same equations that we've been playing around with, but rather than sort of deriving them in, more, in our sort of more workmanlike way of just being motivated to try and do a particular thing, they come at it from uh, the, the, you know, as it were, more abstract end of taking something that was well understood in classical machine learning and mapping it into uh, a quantum scenario. And intuitively, so this FC object is a classical Fisher information matrix. Intuitively, what's happening is that we're reconciling the parameter space to the problem space. What I mean by that is that when we change one of the parameters, how radically that changes the output uh, depends on this Fisher information object. It's not only for, uh, say, machine learning. You can see in the little reference at the bottom of the slide there, it was first developed in the context of neural networks and that kind of thing. But uh, people have used it for understanding even things like genetics. If you, if you change something, uh, which might be uh, changing something at the DNA level, uh, what are the consequences for the observable thing, which might be the sort of the, the actual organism that results. So it's a very, very general concept. And it was nice to see that, that now we have that, that strong link. And uh, coming back to our um, improved performance, we can sort of understand why now, because uh, this, this uh, natural gradient, which is also called a parameter-free or parameter-invariant, because it shouldn't really matter how you parameterize your problem because the first order you're now correcting uh, or adapting to the particular parameters you've chosen so that you can explore the space correctly. Uh, and so, uh, it, quote unquote, the equations now know that this, this trench is a point where one of the parameters becomes, uh, becomes meaningless because of the other one uh, having a special value. Well, uh, pushing on, although that's quite interesting to just meditate on, but I'm aware of time passing, this revelation led us in a new direction um, we'd previously thought about simulating general quantum processes, including non-unitary ones. So we'd already adapted our work to work with uh, density matrices, things like that. But what we hadn't thoroughly engaged with is how do we do this kind of thing, uh, what we might now call this natural gradient approach, where the circuit elements themselves are non-unitary. So uh, why would they be non-unitary? The obvious reason would be because they're noisy. So that, that's very motivated by what we're all thinking about for the NISC era. But we might also have a non-unitary circuit uh, because it's deliberately non-unitary. We might have a measurement where the strength of the measurement is um, a, a tunable parameter. Um, we might introduce dephasing deliberately. Some algorithms go better if you can dephase aspects that you, you want to decohere. Um, so we now have this generality, or we'd like to. And uh, my uh, postdoc Ballant uh, was able to um, uh, take a step further what we'd um, heard of uh, from uh, Stokes and Co. and um, generalize it now to full non-unitary matrices. It replaces the quantum Fisher information, excuse me, the Fisher information with the quantum Fisher information. And again, we find that we now find that this is a, a very efficient way to uh, take value out of these non-unitary matrices. I won't talk you through this, uh, these, these diagrams, but basically quantum Fisher, uh, the, the method he's labeled QFI, um, is the new one, which gets straight down to the solution and uh, you know, is very efficient. A uh, couple of things I want to just throw up, but I will be very quick because time is passing. Um, some other things which are related to this use of what we might now call the natural gradient method. I test, I'm starting these days to say imaginary time or natural gradient pretty much interchangeably. Some work that I know Revelane is very interested in because they kind of beat us to the archive uh, with this concept, which was that of uh, mapping out the entire low level a low-lying part of a system spectrum, not just finding the ground state. Um, our contribution coming a, li a little later was to show that if we do use this, uh, this, 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 this matrix A motivated method, uh, that really supercharges that method, the, the, the technique of discovering the ground states. Uh, I expect I'm being reminded 
that uh, there are five minutes left. Yeah. Okay. I'm aware of that. So maybe don't send me the other reminder because it, um, then I won't have to jump out. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you. So uh, I won't talk about error mitigation in any detail, but I want to just, so apologies for zooming through these slides, but I want to lurk on this one just for a moment. Uh, error mitigation is basically what you do if you can't afford all the qubits you need to have uh, a code like the surface code, uh, which is fully fault tolerant and so on. Ideally, you don't want to use any more qubits, uh, but you are perhaps willing to run the system more times, something like that, the kind of thing we might be able to manage in the near future. Um, this paper, which I'd encourage you to look at uh, for some of the error mitigation techniques, there's now a lot that uh, have been thought about, uh, considers whether or not that's enough. Is that enough to get value out of noisy quantum computers? And uh, the depressing curve is over on the right, where we consider up to 80 qubits. And uh, we assume that it's a dense circuit of order 80, uh, um, depth 80, but with activity on all the qubits all the time. And uh, in order to get the thing to perform the way it would if it were error free, we need something like 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 times as many operations, which is probably a deal breaker unless your system is incredibly fast. However, um, the lower lines, which you can just see in the lower corner of even that what I think of as the depressing figure, um, still pretty good. That's if we can get 10 times lower error rates than the ones that we have in good iron traps these days. So perhaps not impossible to achieve that error mitigation, even as we understand it today, can give us value out of these um, early machines. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom on through this and finish up with just three, bam, 30 second sort of adverts for work, work that I'm not talking about in detail. A boost to the error mitigation, uh, in fact, beyond the paper that you saw on the previous slide, comes when uh, we um, add in special features that are adapted to the particular problem. So here, Sam, who was, I think, a um, first year student when he cooked this up, uh, was um, interested in chemistry in particular. And he realized, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'll move it. He realized that uh, since in a chemistry problem, there are certain things that should be conserved. For example, the number of electrons shouldn't go up and down if we're just looking at the evolution of some closed chemical system. You may as well check those things uh, or for the output of your circuit. And if those things are violated, which they really shouldn't be, then you just discard that. And it improves your signal to noise ratio and is certainly in the class of mitigation, which can be combined with other ideas and these, uh, in the inset of this uh, graph here, we can see the red dots are with standard error mitigation, and that's boosted further by the, um, this filtering or symmetry checking property. A, a bunch of other papers on this, I should say, this is, you know, but this was uh, the one that came out of our group, so I wanted to give it an advert. Uh, another thing, switching now to a, a different topic, if we want to figure out how to turn one kind of quantum circuit, perhaps it, we've derived it on the whiteboard, into another kind, perhaps it's friendly for experimental systems, we can again use these quantum variational algorithms to uh, learn, would be one way to say it, learn the behavior of one uh, circuit into a completely different circuit, which, which we have to discover the parameters for. So if you're interested in that, take a look there to that reference. And finally, um, linear algebra, there have been a, a slew of papers on the archive just at the end of last year on thinking about doing linear algebra with near-term devices. And this is just an advert for our contribution there, which was a numerical study of how well it goes if you try and do linear algebra on a um, QVA uh, with, um, as a function of how tough uh, the, um, the task is, the matrix is. All right, uh, and I'm nearly there, so I'm not going to lurk on these slides very much, but I, this is my very last theme, so I'll take it one minute to explain it. Something even further left field than those other ones is what if we use uh, quantum variational algorithms to try and create for us or discover um, states that would be good in metrology. So here the idea is we've got something like a magnetic field we want to sense, but it's not an ideal world and there are some things that go wrong during the time that our uh, bunch of qubits are supposed to be probing the state of the field and coming back to us. Um, there are processes out there that we don't want to be happening, but we're stuck with them. So how do we design the best possible quantum probe state? Uh, and here we're assuming we're not allowed to act on them when they're in the probe condition, but we get to yank them back out of the field and then see how much they tell us about uh, the field itself. So um, there are some states you could write down, like the GHZ state that looked like they'd be pretty good for this, although sensitive to noise. Um, what Ballant did was he said, well, let's just make it a, a, a variational algorithm problem, and let's just see what kind of uh, states are discovered. And uh, there's a lot of data here, but uh, the bottom line is that we discovered states 
that were better than any of the analytic states people had thought about, especially in the case of amplitude damping. And the challenge there became, um, how do you work backwards to be able to say anything other than, look everybody, I found um, some states that are better than previously reported ones. They were very interesting states because they had a different symmetry to the problem, which, which we, if we were trying to find analytically some good states, we probably have not bothered looking beyond the symmetry of the problem because that seems counterintuitive. So what Valent had to ask himself is what's going on here? How has this circuit found something better than we would have thought of? And it's a bit like the problem that you have with neural networks or things like that. It, the thing works, but you can't easily answer the question, why does it work? But Valent doesn't like to give up. So he um, stared for a long time at states that were described by a whole bunch of numbers. And he picked out, teased out what was going on, which was that the system was creating a state very similar to a GHZ state with a little bit of extra. And that little bit of extra was an interesting state that um, uh, wasn't as good as a GHZ state at probing the ideal case with no noise, but was noise robust to first order. And that's the bit where the broken symmetry lives. So that was, that was pretty cool. And, and once he'd obtained that uh, understanding of the states, then he was able to show why they outperform. But it was an interesting discovery process because essentially uh, the state was discovered automatically and then subsequently understood by a person. Well, that's what I wanted to say. I might uh, just leave us on this slide because as I mentioned, I'm associated with a company called Quantum Motion and we're recruiting people, theorists and especially experimentalists. So if on this slide you see words that refer to your skill set, then please do get in touch. But I'll shut up at this point. Okay, thank you, Simon, for a wonderful talk. So just to remind everyone that's listening, if you have any questions, you can enter them into the Slack channel. So we've got a few questions there. Okay, so the first question we have from uh, Zavi is, uh, how does the natural gradient descent deal with sampling noise and other? Right, good, yes, a, a very significant question. So uh, what I've been showing you is uh, the best, so I would say that, uh, natural gradient, that, that approach um, is the best way we know, and as in my group, and maybe other people who know better, for um, actually performing these, these various kinds of tasks, whether they're, um, you know, let's, let's say it's either you're using it uh, in eigensolver mode, but for any of these, these tasks, including the, the linear algebra and um, the, the compiling, it, it's always the way to go if you can afford to but you need to form this matrix, which you otherwise wouldn't need to do. So there's some cost associated there. And you need to ask um, how robust is it to noise? So to, to, to cut straight to the answer, it deals pretty well. If you take, I don't think I'm gonna zoom all the way back through my slides just to bring up the equation, but if you take that, that you're solving an equation where you have a, a matrix times a vector of things you want to discover is equal to another vector. And that other vector is, is, is a sort of grid, is a gradient essentially. Um, if you inject some noise, you can get away, we find, with injecting more noise into the matrix than into the vector. So the matrix is fairly robust to noise. So you don't, you don't, it, it doesn't have to be uh, obtained to as high accuracy even as the, as the um, gradient vector part of it. So that's some good news. And so things like shot noise, just how many times do I have to sample before I'm allowed, before this, this matrix becomes useful is pretty generous. And as it sort of starts to take its correct form, it becomes much more useful than if we were using the identity. So I could waffle more, but I guess that's, uh, you know, um, maybe, maybe I'll say one more thing, which is, but we're still thinking about the total cost of using this method and we're optimistic, but I don't want to say more than that at the moment is it's quite non-trivial. Okay. There's a few more questions on a kind of similarish but slightly different theme. So oh, right. um, Ben Nyhoff has asked, does this matrix A effectively change the topology of the potential or does it just make it much less likely to run into low quinema? Yeah, I mean, well, what it does intuitively is it, it, it essentially allows the equations to compensate for the fact that as we change our parameters, so you can imagine a parameter space, right, which is just some, you know, n-dimensional space where each of the axes, I guess it's periodic, but each of the axes is, is one of your parameters. And if you change your parameter by a certain amount, in gradient descent, you might say, well, let's, let's, let's only allow my parameters to change by, I don't know, 
0.1 degree or something like that. And, and then I will go a certain small distance in parameter space. But is that a big or a small distance in the real, in, in the problem space, which is the Hilbert space, the space in which the state of the system lives and comes out of the circuit? Um, it, can, it can be the case that if you're turning uh, your parameter um, on your gate, it's not doing anything or hardly anything to the output of the system because at the moment, the particular point you're at, you're very insensitive to that uh, parameter. Maybe I'm going to break what I said and go back after all. May as well be in the middle of the talk as at the end of it. So uh, will I be able to see it from this? Yes, I will. So here, if you look at that little circuit, you can see that if the angle theta one is zero, it doesn't matter what the angle theta two is because if the angle theta one is zero, then that first single qubit gate does not act which means a zero runs along and is the control qubit for the second gate. Uh, but that means the second gate will not act regardless of its parameter because its control is in state zero. And that's what give us the, gives us this trench. But then you can see uh, that if uh, that the angle theta one is non-zero but small, then the second gate will only be able to have a puny um, effect on the, on, on the state that comes out and so forth. So what this, this matrix, or rather its inverse, uh, does for us is to compensate mapping between the one space and the other. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, but that is intuitively how I understand how it works. And uh, we, we kind of knew that, but what we didn't know was this very interesting link to this huge literature on um, how huge it is, substantial literature on natural gradient from the computer scientists. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Um, I guess when I've spoken to you, we've had several conversations about this as well. So when I've spoken to you about this before and uh, looked at the papers, there's also this, um, phrase that I've heard banded around a few times that when you use the natural gradient, the quantum natural gradient, it's in some sense resilient to uh, reparameterization. So yeah, in this yeah. slide that you've got up here, if you just put a two in front of theta one or some constant, yeah. using standard approaches, it would change how it works. But is that not the case for? No, that's right. So that, that, that I think is the merit of natural gradient as explained by the computer scientists since 1998 or whenever it was that you can reparameterize. you can have two different people who've conceived ways, you know, maybe they have different, uh, you know, I don't want to trespass into territory that I really don't know anything about, but if you imagine two neural nets that have the same uh, potential, but they are parameterized in different ways, this kind of technique should allow them to, to both reach their optima, um, uh, because you are to the first order correcting for the fact that you've got different ways of describing the problem. And certainly if you go through and my understanding of angles was all different to yours. You know, I, I, I'd use some different labeling. Um, this, this, this method would completely absorb that, certainly. But more than that, it should allow you to, uh, if, you, if we took two circuits, which are actually equivalent in their power, but it's not obvious to see that because you know, it might be completely non-trivial to show that these two circuits are equivalent. Um, this, this method should uh, uh, correct for that quote unquote parameterization of the problem. Okay. So Ben has replied, so the person who just asked the previous question said, so A is effectively describing a map between coordinates and the geometry of parameter space. And he's ended with OK. So I guess that means that yeah, he's I mean, Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but uh, I should say, what we obtain experimentally from that circuit, oh, I'm not going to go and find it, but that circuit that I boasted is, is pretty easy in the lab. But then that's because I never have to do anything in the lab. But it's, it is easy in the sense that if you're going to be doing these games at all, you better be able to implement your your basic variational algorithm in the lab. And uh, um, all you have to do to, to get the elements of A is to just slightly change that circuit. Um, but you still have to invert it. And, 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 and what held us up for a bit at the beginning of this project is that uh, we haven't figured out how to stably and properly invert the matrix. And there's some non-trivial uh, elements there. And in fact, the nature of the problem even informs how you should do that classical inversion. And I don't know if that's very well documented, actually, because it's the kind of thing that just lives a sort of knowledge inside a group. But we're always happy to chat to people about that side of things. So if you try this and it doesn't seem to work well, it could well be that it's actually the classical step that's giving you the problems and not the, the quantum side of things. Okay, so I think we're running a little bit over time, but there's no talk next. So I think it's okay if we just take maybe one more question. Um, Simon should be able to log in at some point later on and answer yeah, the rest. I'll hop over to the channel if I'm able to see it and just look there for a bit. There's quite a few questions on the imaginary time, but we've already done with two of those. So maybe I'll just ask one of the later on questions that covers some of the material we covered later in the talk. Yeah. So Ying Kai Uyang from Sheffield has asked, do we know the coefficient C1, C2, C3? 
are for the robust state. So presume that he's referring right. to the coefficients. Yes, I, I know what that means. So let me say, do we brain. know what the coefficients are for the robust state? Yes. Well, we do know what they are, but to be quite honest with you, I would have to go and look in my notes or ask Valent if we know how to analytically uh, derive excellent choices for them for a problem of any size. So it's, it's easy to work out what they are because the, 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 the optimized quantum variational circuit, which generates this thing to a good approximation, you just, you just say, well, you know, uh, what are the values of these three numbers that make that an almost perfect fit for the state that's coming out? But, but maybe what's being asked is, do we know how to generate great numbers for that without a, a, you know, a, a through some analytic intuition? The answer is I don't have that, but uh, Valent might. Uh, I would have to go and check the latest version of the paper, so you've caught me out there. But um, you, you said, I, for instance, that the, the third term, the one with C3 in front. Yeah, well, there's, there's two things. that when there was noise present. So presumably, yeah. as you turn the noise down, that number gets right. smaller. Exactly. So down. if we had zero noise, then a great state would be a GHZ state, a perfect, perfect clean GHZ state, which would be an equal superposition of all zero and all one, for example. And then C, C2 would be zero, and C1 and C3 would be one over root two. Now, as we introduce noise, it's the, the, the automatic system has actually found two tricks, really, but it's just one's much more interesting than the other. One of them is to, that actually a bit biased GHZ state is, is I guess, better than an than a, than a, than a equally balanced one because the noise here is a damping noise, which affects, say, state one, but doesn't affect state zero, if you follow. Um, but a much more interesting, could we, but you could come up with that, right? You, you try that if you thought about it for a while, and it still has the symmetry of the problem. But the, the more interesting thing is the C2 coming in and also uh, requiring some of the probability amplitude to go there. It is, um, they're all substantial. So it's not the case that C2 is like some tiny speck of a number. They're all, you know, they're all substantial. I, I sh it's a good question. I, I should just kind of memorize them for six qubits or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah. So um, we, can, we can give them to you certainly numerically, and I think uh, Bannon could probably give you an analytic expression which predicts what are good amounts of that. This, this kind of state comes up for all the even numbered numbers of qubits going in. Good. Okay, thank you, Simon. Well, I suggest right. that we uh, take the rest yeah. of the questions for the Slack session. Okay. And uh, I think for the rest of this session on the program, it says that it's part of the poster session. So people should go onto the Slack channel, look at the various posters that are available there. And um, yeah, we should all thank Simon for giving a fantastic talk. Well, thank you very much. I'm imagining some applause, some level of enthusiasm. Thank you, Al. That's really helping. Um, <laughs> I was one clap. It's like sarcastic uh, clap. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that was that was uh, sorry about the color wheel thing. Um, live and learn. Uh, but I'll go over to the Slack now and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you again. Great. I'm going to mute.